Again, thank you for taking the time. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited. So I listened to your Jared Clickstein episode oh. on Friday. And I mean, that was, I was like, oh my God, I'm, you know, that, that was really compelling, you know, and interesting and entertaining all the things. So good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. He was a very interesting guy when he, uh, had quite a life so far and he's only, he's my age and he still had, had quite a life. Uh, no, for real. I mean, it was very, I was like, oh my God, my topic is not near this interesting. <laughs> and I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's not, I'm just saying to me as the listener, that was really, uh, I'm glad I picked that one to, to listen to. It was me good. Me too. Me too. Yeah. I'm, uh, it was a good one. Uh, this one's going to be good too. This one's going to be good too, Amy. So where are you? You're in Houston or? Yeah, I'm outside of Houston. I'm actually outside a college station at my brother and sister-in-law's this morning. So oh, Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So kind of... I uh I lived in Lake Charles for grad oh. school. I went to McNeese. And Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So Houston was the closest big, you know, big city to me. Right. Uh, 2 well, hours, um... 2 hours. That's where we had to go to the airport when we were traveling. <laughs> you know, oh, the yeah. drive to Houston from Lake Charles. Well, ironically, we just dropped our last kid at LSU. Okay. Uh, to yeah. start his his uh that was his dream, his educational journey has begun, which also means, you know, <laughs> whatever else is going on at LSU is also happening. But That's right. I That's think he's right. having a great time. Yeah. He wants to be an English professor, which is an interesting thing to do in the world of AI. So we'll see how that works out for him. I was going to say, my advice, tell him don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Don't do it. That's where I came out of. Yeah, I was trying to do the same thing. Heavy. Bored. I am heavy, heavy, heavy bored. I may say male is entirely hostile. No! Dinner. Resources. Life. Friends. Is boring. We must not say so. This is Andrew Whitstaff. And you are listening to Heavy Board. And we're recording this on October 27th, 2024. My guest today is Amy Daughters. Amy is an author and public speaker who began her writing journey in an unexpected way. Born and raised in Houston, Texas, she began writing when she moved to England, of all places. She's been a freelance writer for decades, mostly covering college football, among many other things something she often states she never thought she would ever do. Amy's debut novel, You Cannot Mess This Up, A True Story That Never Happened, came out in 2019 from She Writes Press and went on to be the silver winner in the 2019 Forward Indies and the prize for humor in, tw in the 2020 Next Generation Indie Awards. And her most recent book, titled Dear Dana, came out in 2022. Dear Dana is an unusual book by nonfiction standards, as it centers around social media. But more than that, making deep connections by also rejecting social media and writing all 580 of her Facebook friends handwritten letters. The subtitle reads, That time I went crazy and wrote all 580 of my Facebook friends a handwritten letter. She's appeared on The Kelly Clarkson Show, Fox, NBC, and Chicago's WGN programs, as well as the What She Said podcast, among many others. But Amy is a humorist, first and foremost, someone who appreciates the funny in the everyday aspect of living, but doesn't shy away from the more serious aspects of life either. In fact, that's what her latest book, Dear Dana, encapsulates. Breaking the impersonal social media scroll and making real, deep connections with real, actual people. Amy, thank you so much for coming on Heavy Board. Thank you so much, Andrew. What a wonderful introduction. I really appreciate that. Oh, yes, of course. I, I find it best to uh, uh, butter up the guests before we uh, we get into it. <laughs> no. Yeah, I feel, I feel properly buttered up. I'm just like Thanksgiving. I'm ready to go. <laughs> of course. Uh, I like to start this off the same question we ask all writers. It's just kind of, what was your childhood like? Where did you grow up? What did your parents do? How did this all start to form Amy Daughters? Right. Well, I grew up uh, in suburbia, you know, north of far north Houston in the 70s. Uh, 
early 80s and a uh, pretty generic childhood. You know, my dad was a engineer. My mom was a stay at home mom. But mom was mom was still um, she's 84 and still with us. But she was, you know, a wordsmith and had an orange portable typewriter. And I think she really dreamed of writing about Hollywood and I think her dreams, you know, I always had a creative side. I always wrote on the side. I wrote poems and I wrote, you know, I was always writing something, short stories in high school. And I had an English teacher who really encouraged me with that. But I think, you know, mom's journey as a non-writer, who's somebody who probably could have been a writer, but but due to the time she was, you know, a housewife and mom, that wasn't, internet wasn't there. There was no really expectation for her to really, you know, make that into something real. I think her encouragement has always been an important component of writing being a realistic thing for me. Interesting. And you, you said you started with like poems and stuff when you were younger? Like, uh... Oh yeah. Like I, you know, I still have, my mom saved all that, but like cursive, you know, stuff from, you know, Thanksgiving and then and I write a poem, you know, so not, and I have all that and it was all very funny and like rhymey and it was, it, you know, really, foreshadows what was going to happen after that kind of nonsensical and you know ridiculous and then i wrote these ridiculous short stories in in high school and they were all funny and basically like stupid humor like slapstick you know which is kind of what i would still like to do if i could write anything i wanted to so <laughs> yeah the humor what, what did the humor was it just something always was there a funny person like one of your parents like a funny person that you you kind of emulated or were you just the funny one of your siblings or in your family or yeah, I think I was the awkward middle child. I am the middle child. I have an older sister and a younger brother, and I think the humor was my shtick, you know. And I had a grandfather. My dad's dad was was always the guy with a beer in his hand at the parties, like singing with the piano. He was, you know, World War II era guy, and he, but he was the humorist. He was the guy everybody counted on. But he told straight jokes. Like he always had a joke. So I'm not that girl, but I am the funny girl, and I think that's just always been my identity, you know. Yeah, the middle child is rough. I'm the middle child as well, uh, I, and I also have an older sister, and younger brother. Yeah, that's, ah. uh, yeah. So uh, you never know what that comes with it. But yeah, it's awesome. And Houston, you said you grew up in Houston, the kind of suburban area of Houston. Mm -hmm. The suburban area of Houston. So my, uh, you know, I've always been a sports fan. So my the beginning of my whole sports journey was the Astros and the Oilers, you know, and the Houston Cougars, and you know. But that was another important component of my growing up and my relationship with my father. And again, that was something that made me st stand out from my siblings. And I think that's what the middle child seeks. The middle <laughs> child needs, you know, what's my deal? And like, how I'm going to survive this? And I'm going to have to have something different than everyone else. And so, but those turned into writing, sports. Those were kind of the the turns into the bread and butter. What I the things I still love as an adult. Absolutely. Absolutely. I guess you saw a lot of change in Houston too, right? I mean, the city massively grew oh, over exploded. the last, yeah, it's and, Houston is, and you now can it's tell. Very under, yeah. You know, and no, it's please. in a very underestimated, you know, international city that yeah. offers so many, you know, we've moved, we moved to England for um, three years. We lived in Ohio for 12 years. So I've seen a little bit of a lot, you know, a lot of different places and, and then we keep coming back to Houston and it keeps growing and it keeps becoming more diverse. And it, you know, and really the, the city has changed a lot, but it has so much to offer and people don't talk about Houston. Yes, it's hot. Yes, it's big. Yes, there's a lot of traffic, but also you can eat any cuisine. You can, right. you can, you can, you know, mesh with any culture, not in the world, but I mean, it's a very international city. There's a lot of opportunity in Houston. Yeah, and I know whenever people think Houston or Texas, they think, oh, tacos and Tex-Mex, and it's like, well, actually, there's a huge Vietnamese population, and it has, like, great Vietnamese food, and, like, yeah. I mean, Indian food and yeah. whatever it is, and it's excellent, It's and it's and it's very authentic as well, if you're right. a, you know, foodie, it's Houston. People think of Dallas when they are Austin. Those are very nice, cool cities, but Houston is, is a great destination. Absolutely, absolutely. The next one we always like to ask is um, when did reading and writing come into your life? Did that come into your life at like kind of a young age or when did you start really kind of seeing yourself write? And you said you were writing when you were young, right? You were doing right. poems and, I was, and things. Right, and I've always been a reader and my mom is and was a reader. And so she encouraged me to read. I read all the Nancy Drew. I read all the Little House on the Prairie. You know, but then as, a, as any young girl in the 70s did, I started subscribing to Pro Football Digest. Yeah. <laughs> 
because why wouldn't you? Like I was, I was only on the girl on the block doing that. But and so I read sports. I read you know the baseball almanac. I read all that from an early age. And then I think it's a natural. I and mean, I'm sure everyone says this is a natural, you know, attachment reading and writing. And so the the, the the writing happened, and I got attention for the humorous writing as a kid. And as I, I got older, and I you know received a typewriter when I was in college, like one of the first uh, high school, one of the first like little electronic word processors and boy I went to town on that and wrote all kinds of ridiculous stuff and then when I went to <coughs> excuse me I went to college I remember standing with my dad I went to Texas Tech the Texas Tech University I don't want to show off but um, you know we call it the Princeton of the Panhandle you know <laughs> really a high GPA situation but I was standing there with my dad at orientation and this was before you had to declare when you apply what you were going to do and there was journalism we walked this way and the business school was this way and and he didn't say anything I knew he wanted me to major in business because that was more practical but I was you know I wanted to write I knew I wanted to write I, I but I'd never really been trained other than just regular English class, but I went the business route, which is interesting. That's where I walked to. And so that's how I started. So then when I got into a career, I was in purchasing for about 15 years. I would always reread my my emails and think they were hilarious. And like, that was what I wanted to do. I I was still drawn to it, but I didn't have a, a way to get there yet to, you know, start my writing career. Yeah. And we like to ask, going off that, kind of, what were some of the first writers that you were enamored with, or who are your kind of like go-to idols or people you look up to in the literary world? Well, I was always a, a huge. Um, I, I always read nonfiction, so I read a lot of history. So David McCullough was somebody who I really, um, I've read everything he's written. But I mean, my that's all you know broad. And so he was probably the person I looked up to the most. But I was never. It's funny though because I don't think I was ever going to write. I mean, I could still write a book up like I, I'd like to write like a football history book, but that's not somebody I wasn't going to emulate him in my writing style. So if it was somebody who I looked up to from a stylistic standpoint, it would have been like Irma Bombeck, you know, because she was the thing in the 70s, like as a humorous woman writer and talk about somebody to look up to who thinks they're humorous and wants to write. And she broke through a lot of things. She was sitting and I actually lived in her hometown for 12 years in Centerville, Ohio. That's where she wrote from. And uh, which is interesting because I wrote my humorous You Cannot Mess This Up was written. Well, both books were partially written in Ohio, you know, but she she was somebody who just went with what, what, what her gift was and was hugely successful, you know, in a world where women writers, especially humorous women writers weren't going to, I mean, what what she just really was, you know, so that's probably my stylistic and, you know, mentor who I never met in the in the writing right. world. Yeah, of course. Uh, Eve Babbitts, is that, does she ever come in? Or? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So I was thinking Love of like her. those women in the 70s, yeah, that are writing that kind of humorous nonfiction kind of, yeah, that's uh, that's Kind great. of a columnist, you know, that whole mentality of the column, which we don't have anymore. Right. I think I would have made, I think I would have made a fine columnist though, you know, an observer, uh, you know, a humorous take on life, but we don't have those people anymore. Right. You know, we, I, and you grew up, I think you're, in your thirties, you grew up yeah. after me. So you would have been at the tail end of that columnist, yeah. you know, world where we had great, every city had their, had their humorist or their every big, or, you know, mid-sized city where so, there was somebody we all read a sports person and then a, a columnist or a guy or girl who observed life. Yeah, absolutely. I, it's, I always, I bring it up whenever I do have millennials or something on, cause I feel like millennial, we did, we're straddling the kind of the, the old world mm-hmm. and the new world with the, the way the internet and technology has just kind of shifted everything beneath our feet. And so I'm always fascinated to hear that. Cause I, it's such a big change where we're like, we, we used to have these kind of local humorous or, or sports writers that everybody would go to, or even just like a beat reporter, you'd read them right. every week. And, uh, we just don't anymore. Yeah. That's uh, it would, so it's a, it's a deep loss. <laughs> quite frankly. No, yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. It is. And I, you know, you forget about those people till you talk about them, but they were, I mean, you know, you looked up to them, even if not as a writer, I mean, it's just as a human being, you know, it was like a deep connection with the written word, which we don't have, which we don't have now. Yeah. Yeah. And going off that too, I wanted to ask, you know, freelance writing, you know, uh, how did you start doing that? You know, it's almost always something that like we writers kind of fall into, but I wanted to ask, you know, how, how that got started. How did you get into freelance writing? Yeah, and that's a great story because my husband and I both uh, were in good places in our careers. This was like 2002, and his work 
said, we have an opportunity for you guys to move to England for three years. And we, we discussed it. We were like, man, who's going to get to do this in their 30s? You know, we had one kid. We we're like, let's go do it. And I was very enthusiastic. It wasn't like I felt like I was on this forced march because I felt like who's going to get to do that and the opportunities to travel living in the UK, you know. And so we move over there and I quit my job and I, I got to, you know, I was like a director manager of this purchasing department at an adult beverage company. So I had gotten myself in a pretty good spot. And I really don't know what I was thinking career wise. I mean, it wasn't, it was like, a, it was kind of almost stupid, but it was really going to change the trajectory of his career. And I didn't really feel like I was taking it for the team. I was like, this is great. You know, this is going to be a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I got over there and I was like, wait a second, what am I going to do? I mean, this is ridiculous. I, I sent this kid off to the village school. And I, the first thing I did was I went to the University of Birmingham and took history classes. And that was super compelling to, you know, study. Like I studied the World War II era, listening to an English professor, a guy who's from England, talk about it from their perspective. So it was super enlightening, that whole, but that wasn't enough. I was like, I've got to do something. So it was almost out of desperation. I was writing funny emails. This is before social media. I would write funny emails home to my people and be like, here's what's going on in the village. Because we weren't in London. We were in this isolated village outside of the second in England. And I started, a friend was like, you could probably sell that. And so I was like, wait a second. And that's how I started freelance writing. I was like, I can do this. The internet was just getting going. And I realized there was, so by the time we got back in three years, I had another kid and I had what started as a side gig that turned into a full-time, you know, career in writing. And I would have never expected that. I never returned to purchasing. And I basically replaced that with this other job at home. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. And again, to be able to do that, that's even talking back in the days, so you could make a career as a freelance writer. You know, that's even more difficult now. Yeah. <laughs> We've had oh, people, absolutely. Yeah. I hit it right at the right moment, though. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's, yeah, when the internet was exploding with, with, uh, with kind of online papers and stuff. Yeah. And, and articles and, and I mean, I guess there's still, there's always startups for that, but that's great. Yeah. Love hearing that. Cause I'm always interested in, cause it's just like, yeah, freelance writing. It's like, Oh, does anybody set out to be a freelance writer? But then it just happens and you just kind of roll with it and you get this great, great kind of start to the career for it. Right. Um, your first book, you cannot mess this up. Did you always want to write fiction? You know, how, how did that project come into being? You know, when I, when I got, when I started some traction with the writing and the, the biggest thing that happened is I got a contract with the Bleacher Report to write about college football. And so that really changed, you know, cause a lot of this for me had to do with, I wasn't trained to be a writer. You know, I think we want to fit into this. We want to feel like we belong in the niche where we're sitting. And I think I didn't take myself super seriously, even though I was making money doing it. I, since I didn't train to be a writer, I always sat in the meetings and they'd be like, oh, the, they would talk about all this technical stuff. And I'd be like, oh, I don't really get that. But I mean, I know, I, I mean, I know what to do, but I don't really, you know, know what I'm doing, if that makes sense. Well, when I got that contract and I started working with people, I started taking myself more seriously. I was like, hey, these people just sent me to the Orange Bowl. Like, I must be okay at this, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I was just living the actual dream. And I was, and I always had this book idea and I was always going to write myself back in time because I love everything like nostalgic. And like, if you ask me, do you want to go forward in time or backward? I 100% go backward. Love history, love the, you know, looking at old Sears catalogs, going to the antique store. I've got a metal detector. I mean, I've got all the things that would <laughs> line me up for a love of history. So I always had this idea. I'm going to write this hilarious back in time book. And so I had kicked that around for years. And then as, as I started taking myself more seriously as a writer, I was like, you know what? I'm going to write that. I'm going to write the actual book. And so it took me, I don't know, four years to write that book probably because I was doing a bunch of other stuff and I had two kids um, and a marriage and all the things. Right. And, we, and we were in Ohio at, by that time. But I, that's where that idea came from. It was just – it had been in my head forever. And then once I took myself seriously enough to write it, I wrote it. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, and it's interesting that you said like we, we are like when we when were trying to write, we, we want to be a part of that milieu, right? Like the kind of culture of all that. We're like, oh, the hoity-toity maybe a little bit with the literary world. But then it's always like you're, there's the constant uh, drive to be like, I can do this. You know, I can do this. Right. Yeah. Right. And then to take yourself seriously enough to, and people ask me all the time, you know, and I'm sure they ask you, you know, how do you write a book? Well, <laughs> you, you sit down and write, 
yeah. every day. And then you look back and 18 months later, however long it took you, you're like, oh, my God, crap, I have a book, you know, <laughs> how'd that happen? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and and I was looking this up, but tell listeners a little bit about how you began the Dear Dana project that became your second book. Right, right, and that's an incredible story because yeah. I like to tell that I like to tell that story that I was basically just minding my own business because I was, <laughs> and I wasn't I wasn't intending to go on some kind of magical meaningful journey. I was just trying not to screw my kids up, and you know I was I'd written <laughs> the first book. I, I guess the first book was wasn't done yet when that whole started, the whole second project started, and I was on Facebook very innocently like all of us you know, do, I thought about a girl who I had met at a summer camp that I'd worked at like 30 years before her name was Dana. And I was sitting on Facebook and I was like, Oh, I wonder what happened with Dana. And I, the only Dana and I probably spent six weeks together and we were both really loud at this camp and thought we were hilarious. And she uh, is a humorist in her own way. And I, and I think we just connected over that and I'd never forgot her. But as far as like meaningful interaction, I'm, I wasn't sure. But so I look her up. I'm like, oh, there she is. It's Dana. So since it meant nothing, I friend her, you know, and she accept my request. And I don't know if she knows me any more than I know her. But I go and look through her profile, like all the stalking happened. And, <laughs> uh, you know, it was all very innocent. And I look and she has she lives in Lafayette, Louisiana, which is not far from Lake Charles, which we discussed earlier. Yeah. And yeah. She, she she's like she's like overperformed in kids. She's got five kids. Ooh. Like she. Yeah, she like killed it in kids. But she <laughs> so she has these four daughters and the youngest is a son, the only boy, and his name is Parker. And right away I find out this kid's got cancer and it's serious enough that he's at St. Jude in Memphis, Tennessee. So that's the kid's probably fighting for his life. So as a human being, as a mom, I immediately was like, Oh my gosh, this is terrible. And and Dana's very she was very transparent and like talked about all of it. So it's it and she talked about LSU football. So I immediately got engaged, the intersection of those things. I got engaged and I kind of felt like I was overfeeling it a little bit, you know, but I, I just got into the story, even though I didn't I had not spoken to her one word in thirty years, not one one sentence, nothing, you know, electronically or any other way. And so I kind of follow along with the story and uh, then he goes into remission. And so that's relief kind of goes back on the back burner, but she's still posting. I'm still posting. So we have this connection online. We never liked her comment on any each, of uh, each other's things. We were just operating in the periphery on each other's periphery. And so at the end of that next year, she starts posting that, um, She's worried about Parker. So I start watching again and he relapses. They go back to Memphis and she's, you know, this email about everything she's thankful for because they're going back to Memphis. But this is obviously a bad situation. And so I sit down at my desk. It's like a Monday morning and I'm thinking about the two of them. And I'm, I'm somebody who likes to pray. So I had prayed about it, and, you know, but this story can be framed how anybody wants to frame it from a like who was driving the bus on this thing because you know so i sit down at my desk and all of a sudden out of nowhere i just get this idea and it's like a, a lightning bolt hits me and i'm like you know what i'm gonna start sending dana and parker cards at the ronald mcdonald house in memphis and i'll tell you what andrew i had not written anyone a letter in 25 years it's not like i was this letter writing girl you know right. and i hadn't spoken again to this girl in 30 years so and the story also is different levels of me going kind of crazy doing stuff that's <laughs> illogical. And this is kind of step one, because who who reaches out to these people? And this poor woman is, you know, her son is fighting for his life, you know, yeah. but I'm going to send them cards. But I was so invested in this idea, I was going to do it. I had to find stamps I had, and cards. I started with cards because that seemed less stalkerish and I didn't have to write as much. And so I just started writing once a week. And I had this writing schedule with the Bleacher Report. You know, I had like three articles a week. They'd give me the topic the day before and it'd be due the next day. So I just made her my Sunday for Monday. On Sunday, I would write her. I'd, I'd mail the letter on Monday. And I had mailed anything except for bills at this point. I mean, it's like 2015. So I haven't done any of that in years. So I start writing her every week. And it's just like thinking of you, praying for you, hope y'all are good. And then it would expand. I would say more stuff because I had to fill the card. And then it was like a piece of paper. And I would just start writing about my life. And I have no idea what's happening on the other end of this transaction. You know, and so I write for like eight to ten weeks. And then I, and then I look on Facebook and her because there's this social media component to this old school relationship. So I'm watching on so on social media as I'm sending her old school cards. And so I see her tone start to change. And it's obvious that Parker is not doing well. And so I watch it and you can tell 
it's not going well. She stops posting altogether. And then I get on Facebook one Sunday and it's this long post and it, Parker's passed away. He's, and it's just devastating. He's 15 years old. This, the words, these are, her words are in the book, but it's just absolutely devastating. Here's this kid who, you know, lost his battle. Here's this mom who I feel connected to, who I've had no interaction with at all. And it's, and I know it has nothing to do with me, but I just, just am so over feeling. I'm like, oh my God, I'm connected to these people. I kind of felt like I was supposed to write these letters, even though I knew it was stupid and ridiculous. And uh, I was like, what do I do? And so I wrote a condolence card and then I sat down that next week and I'm like, you know what? It was like this just pure adrenaline. I was like, I'm just going to keep writing these letters. I'm going to keep writing her. But then I don't have her address. And so Andrew, I go crazy and I go, well, I know her husband's a lawyer. So I'll just look up his, his address. He's got to have an address. And so I just start sending the letters there to his law office address. And that's, I mean, <laughs> that's like next level. And so, but I just, start, I just keep sending letters and I don't even know why I'm doing it. And to say, I didn't week by week think you're crazy. This is stupid. This is dumb. She's got to think you're just completely ridiculous. And so I just, I just keep writing her. And so about four months into writing her and, and this is really the, this is the point where the story pivots because if this doesn't happen, the rest of the story doesn't happen. The book doesn't happen. The like public speaking doesn't happen. <laughs> and uh, none of it happens after this. She writes me back. I go to my mailbox in Ohio. It's my birthday. I'm kind of hoping maybe somebody send me a card, but that doesn't happen anymore. And here's this eight page letter from this woman and talks about her grief, tells me about her kids. It's like all the stuff I couldn't see on social media. And so this kicks off this unbelievable two full years of us writing each other in like 2016 in the mail. We just write each other back and forth, back and forth. And this rhythm happens where I write, she writes, and in this incredible free space between us is created where I don't know when she's actually reading my stuff. She doesn't know when I'm reading her stuff. So we feel free to say whatever we want to say. We're both looking at our, our lives from the outside in, which is completely powerful because it's like Dear Diary. And I'm writing this girl and I'm like, re, I'm like reordering like my marriage, my kids, because I'm looking at it in a different way because I'm writing about it. And I'm a writer anyway, you know, and so it just becomes this. And, and then she's telling me about her grief. She's like opening up about all these things. And she used to tell me like, oh, I'll, I can tell you this because I trust you. I've never said this before. Like who trusts someone they've never even met in 30 years? Right. But that's what it, it created this space. And the most beautiful thing was I had no idea how she voted. I had no idea what her religious beliefs were. I didn't know about her socioeconomic level. Like I didn't know what she thought about gender equality. I didn't know about any of that. All I knew is – she cared about me and I cared about her like very deeply, like very intimately because of these ridiculous, really, letters. And so I sat back probably six months into writing her, like of the exchange back and forth. And I was like, man, if this something this powerful can happen from this one girl, like what other untapped goodness is out there in this friends list that we all have, like these random people? And I was like, you know, I'm going to write – I think I'm going to – try to write all of these people a letter, a handwritten letter. So I stupidly put everyone's names and I say stupidly not to put the whole project down, but it was done. I mean, it really was ridiculous, you know, and I know that. And so I put everyone's name in an Excel spreadsheet. I print it out. I cut it into little slits of paper and I shove it into a box. I buy stationery and then I sit down the first day and I'm like, Oh crap. Now we've got to write this personal letter. But I like, like had a journal and these are the rules of the project. Cause that's the way my mind kind of works. And I just started writing letters. And once I got on the path of writing these people letters, it was absolutely life changing. And after I got past probably, I don't know, and this sounds ridiculous too, a couple hundred letters, I got to this tipping point where I knew I was going to finish because I knew I was going to, I was living probably the best part of my life in these letters. So I did finish. I did write a book about it, and it absolutely has changed the trajectory of my life. Now I sit around and talk about my feelings and letter writing. <laughs> yeah, that's it, you know the art of the art of the handwritten letter too. And I want to get to this with you, but like, you know, when I um, it is like my wife and I we went to uh, the National Gallery a few years ago, and my wife's from D.C., so we she loves going to there, and uh, we uh, they had this whole display on the art of handwriting. And they had these kind of handwritten letters from great artists, you know, like Jackson Pollock and stuff and, and just kind of back and forth between friends and stuff. And again, studying literature my whole life, that's always a big part of uh, 
of at least it used to be, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, not so much anymore with like, who's right. writing letters back and forth. I'm thinking of like the Robert Lowell, Elizabeth Bishop, like the two big, two huge American poets that had their whole book of, uh, of letters come out just, you know, like 15 years ago or something. And it's incredible, you know, like the thoughts, the kind of intimacy that's between them, uh, you learn that uh, Robert Lowell was in love with Elizabeth Bishop, who we know was uh, a lesbian. <laughs> and it is kind of like, it's this kind of funny, you know, almost, yeah, almost funny thing that happens. But yeah, I mean, the, the idea of, of writing to your Facebook friends, you know, like, uh, uh, I wanted to ask you about social media <laughs> and kind of, you know, what is it about social media that you think made a good, like made for a good starting point for writing letters like that? You know, people often say social media connects us and that's partially true, you know, but but it also puts up barriers that we've, we really haven't dealt with before, you know, and I, of course I mean we by like kind of humanity, you know, like. Right, kind of, right. Yeah. And, I, and I, you know, it's interesting because I learned so much about social media from writing the letters because on one hand, I, you know, none of it would have happened. Like I wouldn't have reconnected with Dana without social media. So to, to, you know, it's not a black and white thing. Like we can't absolutely say, oh my God, it's the bane of society, though it kind of is in a way, <laughs> but it's not because it is a jump off point right. for real yeah. relationship. But I realized over, there, there were so many takeaways that, that seemed so obvious, but, but they were profound only because the number of times they happened to me like over and over because you talk about 580 you talk about 580 letters and that sounds you know i mean that's overwhelming but what we're really talking about and is 580 human beings right that's what each letter represented and what i learned over and over again first of all i had assumed so many things about these people because if you think about your own facebook friends list you're going to categorize that like oh there's my high school people and those are the people i went to college with and then I met them like at a wedding or, you know, at an event that I went to or like some writer's workshop I went to for a week. You know, we got and then there's the family members. But th there were so many people that I just straight up mis miscategorized. But when I when I sat down to write that person, the first thing I had to do was go look, like do a deeper dive into their profile to figure out who the person really was. So over and over again, I was like, wait a second, wait a second. That's not that person. That's this person. Cause you really had to look and that sounds so obvious, but it was a, it was an absolutely, for me, it was a game changer every single time I did it. Cause over and over again, several things happen. First of all, I had to reorder that person. And, and I realized that every one of these people was having a human experience that was just as real as my human experience. And of course, people don't play all their cards on Facebook and some people play all their cards. And right. Some people play <laughs> none of their cards, but you can get a sense if you really go look at someone's profile, you know, because you're going to see maybe some accomplishments. You're going to see some struggles. You know, you're going to see like they had kids, they got married. You can, you're going to see like a job. You're going to see like a, a trajectory of a life and you're going to appreciate that this person's, you know, life is just as real as your life is. And you're going to realize that it, this person is having this, you know, human experience. And then in just the actual art of writing the letter, I, I got into a rhythm of doing that, not because I'm a great person or I was trying to be inspirational. Again, I was just minding my own business. But if you're going to write every one of those people, you're going to have to come up with a formula how this is going to work. And it was so simple because you look at their profile in order to make a connection with who this person really is to find something to write about beyond the first paragraph when I told everyone I was writing everyone a letter. So the first thing I would look at, let's say I'd look at you, I'd be like, Andrew, oh my gosh, look at what he's done and look at the podcast, <clears throat> look at the writing, look at the things you've done. So, and look, you know, you're married, you, you do this and you, you know, you, and so I'd have something to say, and I'm not saying this is, I didn't go stalk your profile, but let's say you <laughs> lost a sibling or, a, or, you know, you lost somebody. Well, it gave me the opportunity to say, I'm sorry. And realize that it was never too late to say that to you, you know, or congratulations on your podcast. I listened to two episodes. I'm going to listen to it now. I'm really proud of you. That's amazing. You know what you've done. Let's say we were high school friends. And so that gave me the opportunity to do that and to appreciate, look at these people I'm connected to. And I found out I was connected to a bunch of badasses you know there was foster parents and educators and you know people who tried to be the american ninja warrior and there were people who had gone to princeton and people who were in the um you know in the government you know highly ranked government official and you know and and then there was people who were stay home moms and preachers and pastors and nurses and it was just unbelievable all these people with all these incredible lives and then the second component and probably the most satisfying 
it, I think that most human thing to do is when you think about somebody you were previously connected to, I'd be like, Andrew, you know, like, so what was our interaction like? And it's just a natural thing you, you would do if, if you wrote all these letters. And I'd be like, Andrew was the guy who talked me down when that guy broke up with me by the payphone in high school. And so the no next natural thing is like, hey, Andrew, thanks for being my friend in high school. Because right. that was a tough time for all of us. We ate lunch together every day. And think about how extremely, like, I'm sure that made you feel, like the letter would have made you feel, but think about how I felt by saying something like that 580 times times then all of a sudden i'm so changed because i'm like oh my god not only am i connected to all these badasses i'm connected to them for a reason they came in at the right time in my life and it all almost seemed magical looking back and all that does is give you hope looking forward like you know who else am i going to get connected to in this whole crazy messy life scene you know and it was just over and over again i found myself just and it sounds cheesy but i was just grateful just just really grateful for all of these people. And I always said, I'm going to get off social media when this is over. <laughs> I always said that. And I think we all say that. Everyone right. says, oh, yeah. my God, I'm getting off Facebook. I'm taking a break. But you know what? Now I can't get off Facebook because I'm connected to those 580 people. And they're my people, you know. So yeah. that's yeah. where we're at with that. It's always interesting. I had a friend that said, you know, like there's the thing with social media and Facebook and stuff is – People would always, you know, in high school, you had people come in and out of your life. People always come in and out of your life. And then like uh, Facebook, the, the, the norm pre-social media was that people would come into your life and they'd come out of your life and you'd kind of never even see them again or think about them again. And then things like Facebook and Instagram and these kind of social media companies, now they're just constantly there. Like somebody that, yeah, you haven't spoken to for 30 years, well, all of a sudden the photos pop up, you know, when you're scrolling through, you're like, oh yeah, you know, and you kind of see them. But like you said, this kind of finding more intimate connections through that, I think it, it you know, it's an attitude thing. It's how you kind of view it, right? Like, like I mean, the, the way you said you kind of, you know, humorously said stalked the profiles but like that's what the nsa does <laughs> like well, right. when they, they go to your social media like if you have social media that's the first thing they see and it's pretty easy to find you know like it's not like it's hidden uh and and yeah but um finding all these connections through social media i think it, it really shows that like it's how you use the tool right like everyone's like oh it's this terrible thing it's this terrible thing because everybody defaults to the to the, maybe the selfish kind of, oh, I'm not friends with them anymore, or, uh, oh, you know, we used to be friends, but we're not, you know, like back in high school or something, instead of taking this kind of, I don't want to say, like, I guess, lack of a better term, like more wholesome or like more grateful approach to being connected, like having these tools keep you connected to these people. And I think you taking that time to write the letters like you're actually taking an extra step right everybody just kind of uses it to scroll 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 and then kind of you know while they're waiting in line somewhere or waiting for a doctor's appointment and then they just cl turn off the phone you know click it shut and then it, they stop thinking about it but then taking that kind of active step to reach out to them to actually keep those fires going you know like keep the fire rekindle it and keep it going and like you know, most people don't treat it that way. And I think that's, <laughs> that's just like, what's so great about this story and like your, your book for this too. And I wanted to ask you like, kind of like, what's the difference between a Facebook friend or an online friend uh, and an actual friend or, or, you know, or is there a difference, you know? Well, I think that's a great question because, <clears throat> and that's something else I learned over and over again, is that the difference is, you know, Facebook allows us to be our social media allows us to be connected without having to make an investment in a relationship without having to do something, you know, cause in our, in our personal relationships, it's all about, you know, sacrificing and investing right. and, you know, and, and, and putting yourself out there and being vulnerable too, you know, and that, that and putting us part of yourself out there. And I think what the letters did is it, it, it came across as an investment to people, you know, and that it, it was almost like taking, electronic people because that's what it seems right. like our profile yeah. friends are and turning them back into it was like this magical process where they became you know they they came you know they started out being these you know electronic creatures and it turned them like into flesh and bone human beings because it exposed them it exposed me it made them feel a certain way it made me feel a certain way and it was like this magical transaction and again it was all the more magical because i wasn't trying to do this i didn't sit out and say i'm going to do a great social experiment because i'm this really smart girl who um 
you know, has this idea. That's that's not what this was at all. And I think that adds to the I think the story turned out the way the story did because of that, not because I'm some – like I wasn't twirling around the field of wheat trying to figure out what to do with my <laughs> life. I just – the story just happened to me, and I think that makes it all the better. You know, it's, it, it, it happened very organically, and I didn't – I found all this out without trying to, you know. But I do think that that's what it, it – it, it, and it isolates us. Social me- media makes yeah. us feel isolated. As much as it connects us, um, it makes us feel like – you know, unless we get a certain number of likes or unless we but but those things go away. It's not nobody's making an investment to hit like no one's making an investment to comment on your post. That's different. But and that's the other side of this transaction with the letters. And it's what the letters meant to people that blew me <coughs> away. I had no idea. And that's why I speak about it, honestly, because it is such a incredible tool we have in our toolbox as human beings that is literally – it's about 73 cents and about 15 minutes of your time you can pull this off. And over and over again, people were just blown away with these letters, and, and they the way they responded to them, I was just – I could not believe how much power they had. And it wasn't like I was – Again, I think the letters were meaningful, and I'll, I, I won't take credit for that because I think it was a natural component of the process. But they literally changed things for people. I mean, they people say they will save their letters forever. I mean, you know, people still show them to me in pristine condition. I didn't know I had that power. Yeah, and like like you said, when you when you press like, people feel like that's all they have to do, right? If you have some major my life event or something. And it's it's interesting. My wife and I just had our first child, uh, uh, literally like eight weeks ago. And it was it was, you know, some people sent cards, some people like you know gifts off registries and things. But like the ones that actually wrote out a card, you know, it was very few that would write out like an actual card or something instead of just clicking the button on the screen to send something with a little like you know Amazon note or whatever. Very tiny. You know, they only give you what like two hundred characters or something right. to write those. It is this kind of it takes the the duty of the friendship or like, I don't want to say responsibility, but just kind of like that back and forth, it kind of takes that out of it and lets you be lazy with it. Like, and even right. when you, you see it on Facebook or something, somebody has like a milestone and they get married, they have a kid, whatever. And then everybody just, you go through the comments, you know, probably 90% of them are just the, the same thing over and over and over and over again. It's like kind of people repeating a script and it feels so impersonal and kind of like meaningless. Uh, instead of the connection, you're getting the 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 engagement, as they say, <laughs> off of right. it. And you're you're getting high off the engagement and not the uh, the connection and the friendship. So yeah, it's just fascinating how that's changed kind of our dynamic with how we interact with each other and, and how we get that. And I keep bringing it back to writers, thinking like <clears throat> the stuff that we know about writers' lives, especially because you know this is my background studying literature. Like almost everything that isn't in the books or isn't in like the public interviews is in the letters that they would write that way have preserved. And, uh, you know, it's much more, uh, informal. It's much more personal. It's, uh, uh, some of the most intimate details, you know, people make fun of like James Joyce, something that was like his letters to his wife or something. And they were like crazy and sexual and like weird and, and all that kind of stuff. But like, it's also like, you know, we wouldn't even know this about him if these letters weren't preserved, like if his wife didn't keep them or he didn't keep them. And like, it's just, I don't know. I mean, it just, it's kind of, it's something that we have forgotten. So I think your book is something that we do. <laughs> like, you know, I wanted to ask like, you know, why handwriting kind of, what is it about handwritten letters that just feels more genuine? Uh, and do you think we have lost that art of handwriting and, and kind of written communication? Well, yeah, I do think we've lost it, but I do think that, you know, that's something that can be reclaimed. There's some things we can't get back. You know, we can't, because what really compelled me, what you said earlier is, you know, once a relationship had closed in our life that we could never have it back. I just wonder what the long term effects are right. of that, because, you know, like, what does that mean? Like, since we can reconnect with almost everyone, it, there's got to be a upside and a downside of that. So what is that? But I'm going to have to think on that. But, but the difference is like that we can't change. Like that's, uh, we open that valve. We're not going to shut it off. But the letter writing, we can – this is something that we can revive. We can – you know, and, and so we absolutely – it is a lost art, but it absolutely can be revived. And now I'm somebody who crazily wants to talk about that and wants to bring it back just because I've seen the power. And I, I'll tell you why I think handwriting is so powerful. First of all, 
it, it, and you, you kind of touched on this, it's super intimate. You know, it is, it is a reflection, just the handwriting itself, just the art of the handwriting. It, it is a reflection on who we are. You know, I write, I have horrible handwriting, which is hilarious <laughs> for a girl who went on a letter writing campaign. I'm not a good speller, you know, so, and, I, but it, it shows a vulnerability because it's almost like film photography, you know, you're not going to do it over and over again till it's perfect. And that's why that – like the pendulum is swinging back to stuff. We want stuff that's more authentic. Right. you know. But it shows the reader that you're not perfect, which is so comforting in the age of filtering and getting it all right. And there's something to be said for electronic communication because we couldn't you know, do – the things we do at the volume that we do them without it, you know, so I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't, we should write everything down by hand. That's ridiculous, <laughs> you know, but there's something when it's one-on-one -on -one communication, so beautiful about scratch outs and misspellings. And I tell people this all the time. They're like, Oh, I'm not good. My handwriting's terrible. That's great. Because that, that you're showing a part of yourself to somebody that we don't see anymore, you know? And the other thing is, what I didn't understand when people got the letters, what clicked in their mind, I think just from speaking to people who received the letters, they saw the amount of effort that it took on your part to do this. And you can have the same impact in a card. This does not have to be like a sympathy card or a congratulations yeah. card, which is what you spoke to about, you know, you're having your first child and the congratulations you got. But people, when they pull that out of the mailbox, because they're living the same life you are, they're going to connect the dots. All of a sudden, they're going to be like, oh, wait a second. Andrew had to sit down. He had to find a pen. He had to get the card. He had to go. He had to write something. You know, much less even what you wrote. If you wrote something nice and all you have to do is just write what you felt, it's not like it's not a hard thing. You don't have to be a writer to do it. It's like I was talking about not feeling like a writer. You don't have to be a writer to do this. You write down what you feel, but then you had to put it in the envelope. You had to seal it. Wait a second. What's this person's address? You had to figure that out. Then you had to get a stamp. Then you had to get in your minivan and drive across town and find a blue box to stick that thing into, you know, and think about all that effort it took. The way you're going to leave that person feeling at your mailbox, their mailbox, I will tell you because I experienced this hundreds of times, or I, I, other people did, and I've experienced it myself. You're going to be like, if you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board. To get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast, become a subscriber at Patreon.com/slash Heavy Board. That's right. Heavy Board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored, full-length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers-only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavyboard. Holy crap, I matter to another person this much. And, and that deliberate action on your part is going to mean more probably than what you said in the letter or card. It's just going to be the act of – it's taking that person from being this isolated person getting likes and like you said, the same congratulations that are generated by Facebook to being like, like this is how much I matter to another person. And you will freaking blow their mind. And, and more than anything, you're going to make their heart feel – completely differently and it's literally going to cost you 73 cents and 15 <laughs> minutes of your time <laughs> yeah absolutely the, the, and i think like the handwriting too like i mean i know there's always kind of talk of like they don't even really teach cursive anymore in a lot of like grade school mm -hmm. and just kind of because like, oh that's a useless skill to be able to write out more quickly or something or the elegance of script and kind of calligraphy but yeah, I mean, it really is like, like, I like the way you put it, like a part of you, that's what makes it different, right? Like, that's what like, it's not just like a, a pre pre made font that you're clicking on the screen and typing out. It's your handwriting, your errors, you know, the cross outs, it's this kind of, you know, the, the extreme version is people would say for writers, you know, bleeding on the page or something like oh, that yeah. kind of metaphor. And that's kind of the extreme version of it. But it is kind of like that a little bit, you know, you're not writing in blood or anything, but you're, you're you are kind of putting a part of yourself on that page and this little piece of paper that was nothing becomes something like becomes a part of you and this person and a part of the relationship. And I mean, again, I keep bringing writers up, but then the, the, there's makes it worth preserving all of a sudden because you made that effort. So now it's worth preserving. It's worth keeping. It's worth 
putting in the memory box or the keepsake box, you know, like it all of a sudden we just added this value to it that you just don't get with, uh, with, without we're typing or, or just, yeah, commenting on there. And yeah, that's and, fantastic. No, please go and, on. Yeah, please. And then from a content standpoint, you're going to say, if you sit down and write somebody a card or let her get a note, it does not have to be, I think the problem with my story is it's overwhelming, like 600 letters, two pages each. I mean, like, you know, like that's great. It gives me a jump off point to talk about it. I think that's why the universe gave me the story or however you want to frame that, like who gave me the story. But you, you know, it, it's a great jump off point because it gives me something ridiculous, you know, like this extreme thing to talk about. But it doesn't have to be like that. It can be like, you know, one paragraph because it's got to be what your personality is. But but sitting down to write someone is is freeing because – I don't know when, when you're going to read it. So it, it, it opens up. That's what that intimacy is. That's why, you know, the great letter writers, the ones we read, I've read so many books about these, you know, <laughs> pen pal relationships, you know, author relationships, but it gives you this freedom to say it's so authentic. You're going to be so much more authentic because you're not being intrusive. You don't know when they're going to read it, you know, and you're not looking for a reaction. It, it, it almost takes the, that anticipation we have with electronic communication. It just, it just takes it away because you, you can't really expect anything because you don't even know if they're even going to get it because the post right. office could have messed it up. <laughs> but that, that gives you this freedom to say stuff you would not normally say. And Dana and I's story speaks so much of that. Here are two people that know nothing about each other who found out each other about, uh, crossing letters. you know, And it gave us such freedom. We said stuff to stuff. We weren't saying it to people in the same house we lived in. You know, because that's how powerful it is to sit down and write somebody. And you only, I think, to sit down and experience it, it's real easy to look at pen paling or letter writing and think, oh, my gosh, I'm making such a difference to all these people, which you absolutely are. But really, the person who's the most changed is the person who sat down to write the letter or the card or the note. Right. Yeah. And when you were saying about how, like, kind of the the, in, the urgency of, like, response, like, even emails – when you're sending emails and you're in the Gmail or something and it says, oh, four days since you sent this, no response. You start to be like, well, they're ignoring me. Like, and I know you yeah. got this, you know, whereas that kind of is eliminated with the letter, with the letter writing and it kind of makes it a little less, uh, you, you don't have that feeling of, uh, oh, I'm being ignored or something that you get with, with online communication. It kind of, yeah, that's, that's something I think nobody talks about anymore at all. Nobody talks about that. Like, and, and right. nobody mentions it and it's, it's, so important. Uh, I wanted to ask you this because uh, you, you call yourself a spreader of hope. Uh, wh what do you mean by that? Well, I think that, you know, one of the biggest takeaways from the letter writing was I wrote so many people, Andrew, who I, I knew because a lot of people put themselves out there on social media. I knew I didn't agree maybe politically. I do feel like this aligned me a lot more as a centrist because I wrote to so many people who didn't believe exactly what I believe, who didn't. And when I sat down and looked at these people's experiences, then I started to appreciate why they believe what they believe, you know, but, you know, I, I didn't have the same religious values. I wasn't living the same kind of lifestyle. I didn't vote the same way or whatever. And I realized over and over again that once I, this deliberate exchange happened and, and, you know, I had a, like a 75% uh, response rate. And so a lot of these people responded to me. And once we, like you said, you, you um, reignite that relationship, you open that door over and over again. I realized over and over again, like, you don't have to believe exactly what I believe. You don't have to, you know, operate your life the same way I operate mine for us to be connected and to care about each other. And we've almost got to the point where we're like, not only will I love you or like you, um, only if you believe what I believe, but I'll only connect with you and listen to you. It's like conditional connection. And I realized over and over again, the connection was more important than what I perceived they believed and I believed and this, you know, this gap between us over and over again. I was like, man, that's my person. Like, screw that. I don't care. I don't care how you voted. I mean, I do care. I mean, we all care, especially right, right now. I yeah. mean, everyone cares so deeply, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter yeah. if I have this connection with you and I care about you. You know, and I and I also have looked and seen your human experience, and you've looked and seen mine, and you're like, crap, we're all just trying to get through this thing together. I mean, this is a mess. I mean, this is beautiful and messy and, you know, screwed up, and we're all screwed up, you know, and – but that connection is more important. So I say spreader of the hope because when I tell this story, I hope one of the biggest takeaways is like, screw all that. Let's Let's rejoin based on the fact that, no, we don't agree, and we're going to – 
we're going to be better and more enriched people if we will listen to the person on the other side of that abyss we have created between each other. You know, we we are better off. And that's what these letters were. These letters crossed that line because I wrote a lot of them during the 2016 Trump and Clinton presidential election. Oh, yeah. And that was super powerful because over and over again, these letters crossed lines. And I'll tell you what, and I know I still – and I'm not saying which side of the line I stand on now or then, <laughs> but if someone on the other side of the line walked in this room that I'm sitting right now who I haven't seen in 15 years, and it's one of those letter writers, it would be nothing but a big old hug and probably some tears and feelings because yeah. cause it's more important. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it is interesting that because that was the moment that it's kind of that, yeah, that the 2016 election, everybody's tired of hearing about it. But it's just kind of that was the moment where social media did take this kind of very impersonal turn. And maybe it was because we kind of have the, you know, all you do is hit like. People started to obsess over the political differences. And everybody remembers that time pre-2016 when that really wasn't the biggest thing when you were talking to somebody. It was not, you know, pol politics like the, you know, the thing, don't don't discuss politics at like a dinner party or something. Or right. It was manners to not do that, like politics or religion or, or something, right? Like it, it just, oh, don't, don't discuss this at a time when you're just in polite company. And then that all went out the window and it's interesting how the letters you know like like i don't know i mean i'm just thinking of this now but i'm thinking like is it you think it's just like the kind of how impersonal social media makes it like where we're just hitting the like button or the or you know not hitting that which is a a, a form of you know i don't like oh, that yeah. too protest yeah. yeah uh is is that kind of what makes us feel less impersonal like i, I don't know we got to this point where that became the most important thing when it when it's it's in the order of priorities of life. You know, it is very low down the list for most people. Most people are just kind right. of repeating something or there is that kind of instinctual, you know, kind of gut feeling a lot of times when it comes to politics and we kind of rationalize from, you know, backward from that, you know, and, and I don't know. I mean, it, it's. So it's, it's something like so simple as just writing a letter and being a little personal about it, like can really break down that initial wall. Whereas like an old friend you see, you know, uh, posting something about whatever their preferred candidate. And if that's not your preferred candidate or something, then you're like automatically kind of, oh, screw them or something or, yeah. like, oh, like a uh, block them or mute them or whatever. I don't need to hear that or something is instead of like thinking about, I don't know anything but that <laughs> you know like anything right. but that politics uh, well and that's become acceptable too this yeah this yeah. you know that we not, not only can we post about it but we can be hateful about it and now yeah. you you use the example of dinner parties now we decide who we invite to our dinner parties based mm -hmm. on what we think they did and i think you know people say this is so cliche to say it's easy to say what you want to say on facebook because you don't see all the people you're impacting but that's kind of what the letters did for me because then i would worry about because <clears throat> i know now i know this person i've had this connection with this person who, who i know doesn't believe what i believe but i don't want to offend that person because i care about them more than i care about the belief and 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 that really goes into like the, when i wrote the book you know the, the book has a definite you know spiritual component because i'm a christian you know but i i struggle with the picking the right publisher because i did not want it to be boxed in because right. there was so many people i wrote to who don't believe what i believe and i wanted right. them just like the letters to be welcome because that's it's our story it's not my story it was our story it's 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 jewish people's story and people who are atheist story and people who are christian story and people who are buddhist i don't care what people believe you know and that's part of what the letter writing thing taught me and so i i try now when i'm on social media i don't want to post about politics i don't want to post not because i'm a good person but because i wrote all these freak you know ridiculous letters mm -hmm. and i feel like i owe it to these people that i'm not gonna because i care about them and i don't want to put something out there that's going to but it's it's hard to see like without the letters my perspective might not be that way because we think we can just put it out there and now now the now the rule of thumb is you know you got to put it out there and you got to go hardcore you know and if you're not upsetting people then you're not doing it the right way i kind of feel that way i don't know if that's true or not <laughs> It does kind of frame it that way. Yeah. And I think people confuse their addiction to these kind of, I call social media addiction software. It's basically like, I think people confuse their addiction with the software to like, you know, checking it every day when you wake up or something or throughout the day when you're bored uh, because the politics is just on there or yeah, whatever's just on there. You're just engaging with whatever's put in front of you and you're not kind of 
like you said that i mean even with the letter writing it's it's more purposeful you're making like that you said the smallest bit of effort <laughs> the smallest bit of effort you're just making that little bit of effort to uh right to not just be like mindlessly scrolling and having things put in front of your face but to, to make a deliberate action to take a deliberate step towards uh reigniting a friendship or yeah like kindling that flame back to life and and you know yeah you know kind of blowing on it and stuff but right uh going off that i wanted to ask you kind of the, we're talking about this kind of the meaning you get out of letters and kind of the connection and more than letters right the connections you get through the letters and again this isn't a podcast where we want definitive answers just you know amy's thoughts on this why is meaning so important to us for living you know why, why do we crave it so much why do you think that we're we're all kind of starving for it right now <laughs> Yeah, I think we we want to know we we matter to other people and that we're valued. And I think that's something that social media, though a great jump off point, a great connecting point, it's something that because of everything we've been talking about, like so if they hit like, does that make me have meaning? Do am I doing something in the world that's meaningful? You know, or if I post and two hundred people like it, does that mean that what I'm doing you know, means something in the world, who I am means something in the world. And I think there's such an emptiness about it that we're seeking it even harder than we did before we had social media. I think we lost something and we, di we didn't know it because we, we were forced to be deliberate in our relationships before this. And right. now we can say, I have 600 friends. And and, uh, and and I do have how many ever friends I have on Facebook. Right. And not because the letters, those are real connections that were based on a real relationship at some point in my life. But as far as meaning, we don't, and you've said it over and over again on this podcast, we don't have to do anything other than right. something that is lazy, not because we're lazy people, right. but because, because that's an, uh, that's been offered to us. You know, it's been offered to us as an opportunity to be in a relationship. You know, we don't have to go outside of that. But when we do, and that's where my story comes into play, when we do, something so magical happens, you know, and so meaningful because people feel like they matter, you know, that they matter. To, and I had a guy write me who, like, living a totally different lifestyle. You know, I'm living in suburbia outside of Houston. He, he was living in Los Angeles, high school friend who we sat and had lunch every day. Um, who kind of made you know high school better and I told him that and and I told him this was one of the first letters I wrote and it was in it's in the book and it was like you know you know we have different views on stuff but I just want to let you know that especially if we we grew up in this tight suburban box I really appreciate the fact that you expressed them because I feel like I've learned so much from you and I think you're brave you know and he wrote me back and he said you know and it, it speaks to what you just said he said your letter made me feel like my life has meaning and I have done good and I have hope that I can continue to do good in my life. And this is what this guy said from a two page right. letter. And I, it, it's not about me being a great writer. It's, it's the, that's the impact that simple act had on this one person. Like I feel better about my life moving forward. I, mean, I had no idea I had that power. And I think that letter was purposely put at the beginning of this project because it was like, wow, right. look what I, look what can happen by doing this. You know, it's kind of power it has. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's it's so interesting that you say that with like, you know, everybody's searching for this thing, but like what it would like the kind of the impacts you have on people. And I guess, you know, like whenever people are on their deathbed, the stuff that they're talking about where they're saying, oh, I wish I would have done something like this or I wish I would have mattered where like, you know, I, I bring up this movie all the time, but the it's a wonderful life kind of like thing where like, right, you don't you know, you're so consumed with, you know, your, your hopes and your, your goals and, and all of that and what you want to do kind of in the physical world, you know, materialist world for some people, whatever they want to call it, like you are not seeing the whole picture, right? Like kind of like all the little people that come into your, and this is, I think, kind of a big thing of writing and writing fiction in particular, like the little tiny impacts that everybody has. And I've thought about it more and more <clears throat> in kind of recent years, like, you know, even if I'm going out, you know, somewhere public, I work from home mostly. So when I'm going out, I'm going to the store or I'm going to the gym or something. And I, I always try to smile. I always try to hold the door. Like I just like something like when I'm walking my dog in the neighborhood, I'm picking up the trash, just like other people see that. And I think it just, it, it, those little tiny interactions, they do make a difference in somebody's day. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it is kind of those things where you're like, somebody's so consumed about their career or something and then you get a letter out of the blue from a high school friend and talking about how much you know how much you meant to me in high school you could really made high school better for me just kind of you're like man i haven't even thought about that and then they get that response that you got from it it's just 
it's so, I mean, uh, people say this all the time, but I mean, maybe we are kind of losing that intimacy or that gratefulness. Maybe we're taking it for granted. We're, we're taking it for that. It was always there. And, and maybe it was always there until we kind of all put a screen between us when we're communicating, but it's, and it's still there though, I think is the point you're making, which I, I love. Yeah, I really do. Yeah. 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 It's still accessible. That's the thing. It's not something, it's something we've lost, but it's not, it's not something we can't, return to you know and i it, i thought after i wrote the last letter i was like oh i was so done i mean if if, if you read my <laughs> journal it was like oh my god i can't write another letter i mean and i literally had like a bloody finger from where the pen rested <laughs> i mean you talk about the blood dripping on them i love that and i, I like want to sit around and think about it for the next two hours by myself but i i was like i can never write another letter and i had to stop taking friendship requests because i got to the point where everybody knew about the letters and so people were friend requesting me so they would get a letter <laughs> and i get that you know like people were waiting for their letter and that helped me finish for sure that momentum because i knew people were waiting for their letter and it wasn't their fault that i drew their name out last as opposed to first but i i, I cannot now i cannot stop doing it I mean, we're how many years right. after the fact? I still write someone. What I try to do is I try to write one or two people a day, like a card. And I do exactly what you said earlier in the podcast. You said, you know, we we see people who, uh, you know, can be congratulated. And so we say congratulations on Facebook or right. like you just had a baby, like congratulations. Or – and you, you post about it. You know, you post about an award at work or you post about – your sister struggling with cancer or whatever it is. Well, I have a notebook and I just write down everything I see. And then every day I pick one or two people and I just write them a letter or a card and just say, Hey, congratulations on your award. Hey, you had a baby. Congratulations. And you know, most time I don't send a gift or anything because these are people who I don't do regular life with, right. you know, but, but the impact of that Andrew is, and for me, it's adrenaline because you know what every day I get to do every single day I get to get up and be like, I can make a difference today. Like for all the crap that's going to go wrong today, this is the one thing that's going to go right. And it's just every single time it fills me with hope. Right. And, and, and I'll tell you, I, every single time I sit down to it, I'm like, Oh my God, I'm going to write another letter. That's really what I, cause I'm a human being. I'm not some great person. I'm like, Oh, but every time after I do it, I'm like, man, that's the best thing I'm going to do today. You know, that's the best thing I'm going to do. Cause it reminds me that in this big, ugly, nasty world, we can, we can, and it sounds so cliche, like I'm a unicorn with rainbows coming out my butt <laughs> and I'm prancing around on some stage somewhere. But it's so freaking true. Yeah. We can. We can re-harness some of that. We can take some of it back. We can. Yeah. Yeah. And then recently, because I've had a lot of life events this year where the, yeah, I had my first child and then my brother got married and stuff. And I was thinking recently because, you know, my parents' friends. And, you know, a lot of my parents' friends, they've been friends, you know, 40, 50 years at this point. My parents are in their 70s. And it's it's just like this this i was thinking about that too because my my parents kind of you know closest friends this other couple just kind of i never thought about it before maybe it's just me getting older and you can look back more you know when you're not in your 20s anymore uh looking back like just how much they meant right how much they impacted my life too uh you know watching us and stuff during emergencies even you know like my parents needed to do something the death of their parents or something when i was a little kid you know, I would go stay at their house, you know, their friend's house or something for a week or a couple of days or something. And it just kind of, yeah, like they, they send me very nice things, you know, congratulating me for the child. And I was just thinking, man, like, you know, I, I didn't realize how much even just something like my parents' friends who was, yeah, maybe it was something I took for granted. Uh, you know, I'd see them all the time, you know, during events or parties or something and just didn't think about like how much that impacts too, you know, the kind of social circle that kind of just, you know, webs outward from, from, you know, your family home or whatever. And yeah, so that's very, and they, yeah, and again, those are the ones that sent me the kind of handwritten cards kind of more so than others, you know, and it's how much that impacted and, and how much, you know, they enjoyed seeing me grow up and seeing me hit these milestones, you know, right. probably not as much as my parents, but, you know, pretty close to just as much, you know, because they were so involved, you know, in right. their life and, and seeing me grow over the last, you know, 35 years of my life. So it's, yeah, it's something I didn't think about, but it's, it's very important. Well, and then, you know, and that, and, and again, the letter writing, the whole project, it allowed me, I wrote those people in my life, those same people, my parents, friends right. who I grew up with. And I was, you know, and the ones that were still living, uh, um, cause my mom's 85. So that was, so my people are, you know, older than your people, but those people like teachers and 
you know, mentors. And I wrote those people and said those things you're talking about. And it just put my, like you said, gratitude for sure. I was grateful. And then it made me realize too, you know, you've just had this kid. I'm, I'm my best friend's kids version of that. I get to be that person in their life and they're going to sit back one day and have a kid and think, Oh my gosh, look, look at she and my husband, me and my husband were those people to those kids, you know? And so it did have that power of putting that all in perspective, but, but the, but the opportunity to thank all those people like over, like my aunt, my uncle taught me how to drive. I'd never said thank you for that. You know, I was like, thank you. When we would ride home from work, you would let me drive your suburban, like why you did that. And I did not go off the road. And like, that was a a dicey move map. You know, they let me drive your car, but I got to say that over and again, thank you for doing that. I never said any of that. None of it. And I, and I said it in these letters. It was the most gratifying, like over the top. And I tell people this all the time. It took me 18 months to write the 580 letters. That is the best version of me that there will ever be right. was that that person. And we put that last letter in the mailbox. I made a big deal out of it. I took my kid. He was like 11 at the time or 12. And I made him take a selfie and he was so pissed. He was like, mom, stop, you know, but I wanted to, you know, recreate. I mean, like I want to remember that moment forever. And we put the letter in the box and he looked at me, he looked up at me and he said, and you know, I just dropped him off at college now. And he looked up and he said, mom, that's probably the most important thing you're ever going to do in your life. Wow. Right. Yeah. And to know that, like when you're that young too, right? Like, I think that that's, it's so important that, you know, there's this philosopher, he's kind of, I don't like to even mention his name because he's kind of controversial, which means he's, you know, politically so. But right. one thing he says that I think people don't give him enough credit for is he, he says, you know, ask yourself, are you a better or worse person than each of your four grandparents? And he says, the reason he says grandparents is because you probably knew those people, right? Like you probably spent time with them and all that. And I do think about, like, ever since I heard that, I, st- I think about my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, and kind of just like, wow, like, man, he, like, am I able to live up to that? Kind of what he would do every day. You know, Great Depression era, kind of, you know, he was selling papers at eight years old in Baltimore City, you know, kind of thing. And then he went on to be a lawyer and a kind of very giving person. And I just think about that kind of those things. You know, you don't see that on social media. You don't see that on, on just through likes and reposts and comments. and But you would get that through just taking a simple moment to reflect, like you said, just saying thank you to somebody for, for even thinking about that or, or helping you open your mind up to thinking about that. And it kind of, yeah, I don't know. I just, something I've been thinking about and you saying that really reminds me of it. Cause you know, we are so affected by that. Like not just that, but the adults in our life when we're growing up and then like the other people around us as when we're actually adults and stuff. And yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. I've never heard that. Yeah. It makes me wish I could have written my grandparents a letter. Right. right you know, yeah. and, and, you know, that I would have, I wrote my mother, my father passed away right as my first book was going to come out. I mean, he knew about the letters, but I mean, that's, you know, but again, that's, you know, it's a, it's a great question. But, but I will say that those people I did get to write a letter to, it just, again, I, and I can't imagine my life without the letters now, you know, right, I can't yeah. imagine yeah. like who I would be. And I mean that not because I sold books or spoke about it or whatever, like <laughs> blah, blah, blah. That all just happened because I got to a point with the letter writing. I got about 250 letters in and I was like, Oh my God, this is so special. I'm going to have to share it. You know? And that was tricky. Cause I had Dana's story in there too. And here's right. this horrific, the worst thing that's going to happen to those really dear people. And I was going to, you know, write a book and make money off of it but right, i'm just yeah. saying but but the process of the letters is so much bigger <clears throat> than anything that came out of it commercially or financially or i mean it right. just you know it's just everything so yeah i'm thinking of this now too was there was there a struggle or did you like have to be like ooh, should i publish this like was there a part of you that was um i don't know hesitant like feeling because like, especially whenever you write nonfiction, oh. you're know, like this is kind of a theme on the podcast kind of how much responsibility do you have to the people that are populating your book right because if you're writing nonfiction, you're like real people are populating your book oh it's it not was just yeah <coughs> characters and that's or a great yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and that's a great question on a couple different levels because the book is kind of a you know anthology i mean it's it's a book of letters though um because i use you know, examples from 52 of the Facebook letters. And then there's, you know, direct words from uh, 
between Dana and I's exchange. So on one level, it was really difficult because what happened with Dana and I is we we turned into like real life best friends. Right. And so now I talk to Dana, like she texted me right before this podcast and said, can you talk? <laughs> I was like, no, I'm going on an actual podcast, you know? And so I'm best friends with her. So th the first part was tricky. Am I going to write this story of Parker? So I sat down with her and her husband and was like, I want to write a book. And the the publisher was well one person i worked with was like do you think it's two separate books like there's the dana story and then there's the letters and i was like no it's really the same thing because one doesn't happen without the other you know and so they were like no we want you to write the book we want you to do what you, you know whatever and so but the first pe people to read the book were dana and her husband before my husband read it they read the first manuscript and they were like absolutely go for it and they i mean i think personally and i have no business talking about this i think it keeps parker's name out there you know right. the book does the book yeah. talks about their son and that's what they want and what an honor to be a part of that but the second part was once i finally got you know the publisher and all that on board i had to go to every person even though they were anonymous in the book most about 80 percent of the 90 percent of the people are totally anonymous the letter recipients i had right. to go to each person and get them to sign a waiver that said right. yeah. yeah i'm not identified but my words are used in your book and that was a whole nother year process right and i you know i gave them the opportunity to read their chapter if they wanted to and so then i got 100 percent participation though from right. the people so yeah but that that responsibility is i think as a nonfiction writer that's what keeps you up at night because you're like well you know what are these people's reaction and i had the a, additional emotional burden of feeling like this project was our project dane and i's project and my relationship with these 580 people it was our story so i felt a huge responsibility to tell the story in a way that included everyone and that everyone was going to be you know proud of really you know yeah absolutely absolutely yeah and the last couple of questions amy they're all kind of writing questions but before we before we move on to the just the kind of the writing kind of questions for like the you know the actual craft of it uh, I wanted to ask you about something that I, I saw when I was looking up. I wanted to ask you about your love of flowers and kind of arranging flowers. You know, that that's something I think is another kind of an art that's being lost in most people's homes now. You know, uh, I would I wanted to ask, you know, what, what would you say you get out of having fresh flowers in the home? Because, you know, I'm someone who believes in aesthetics <laughs> and the power right. of aesthetics and having something nice and fresh in your home, you know, like freshly arranged flowers just really intrigued me. You know, how, how long have you done that as a hobby? And, and did you know, did you get that from your mother or somebody in your family or? No, my mom, my mom didn't, she didn't, she likes flowers, but she, she didn't do that. And I think I started doing it in England because it was a mood thing when we yes. moved over there because it was one, it was dark. And two, I was alone. I didn't know anyone in this village, you know, right. and I, and, and out in England, they sell all of that outside. Like you go into the village and there's always these fresh flower stands. Well, I started buying it there because I thought they were pretty. And I was kind of out of my mind because I was in a whole nother world. You know, I'd been deposited in this other life that I knew nothing about where there was all these British people. And I was the only, only American in the town, which was I was like a celebrity, which was great. <laughs> they should have picked someone better for the job, though. But anyway, so I started doing it then. And I work from home like you do. And I love nothing better than to walk by the flowers, you know, several times a day because they're outside my office in the kitchen. And I, it does something, and I'm not good at the arranging is the other thing. I, that's not in my <laughs> wheelhouse. But I love it, and I love it when I make something. And I think I like it too because it's for me and for my family, and it doesn't have to be validated by anyone else. Right. Like it's not my, – my sister-in-law is actually a florist, and she's really good at it. And I always think, oh, God, she's not going <laughs> to like this one. Like she came over to my house like I've taken it all down. No, I won't. But it just is something it's – like, it's like something I just let myself do even though I'm not good at it, and I'm proud of it. You know, yeah, and uh, and it's funny because I have two kids and they're both um, boys, and I have my husband. They love it. They would never tell you that, but right. they love it. And I think when I'm out of town, they miss it. Now they're all yeah. gone. I mean, everybody moved on, but it. Um, I think they love it too. It's just an expression. I think it's just part of our home. You know, right. it's part of who we are, and I and I love it. And another it's one tiny, of my favorite things. Yeah, another tiny little thing. It doesn't take much effort. Doesn't take much time out of your life. But then you get this huge benefit from it, you know, like just kind of something so small. And I just, I think that's so important. And I just intrigued that you had that in, in your what a great website question. and stuff. Yeah. No one's ever asked me that. And I, yeah. and I am sad when the vase is empty. Like I'll come back from a trip and I'll be like flowers. I gotta get flowers today. Exactly, like I gotta yeah. get them in there. And it's funny. Sometimes my husband will do them and he's oh, pretty good at it yeah. just because he knows that. And I think it's cause he likes it. That's exactly, the thing. They're not yeah. there. Let's get it. Let's get the flowers back out. You know? Yeah. 
it's just, yeah, it's just something that's so small. You walk by it and just kind of the entire aesthetic, your mood, everything is just kind of, you can smell them almost, you know, they yeah. you walk through and yeah, it's just nice to, you know, people always have house plants and stuff, but a lot of times if they don't have flowers, like bright color things that have a great scent, they're just like a little green, you know, fern or something. Yeah. House plant. It's not quite the same, although it's still nice. It's not quite the same as like having these freshly cut, you know, oh, like, you know, Amy did that, you know, <laughs> or like, yeah. yeah, like, you know, my mom yeah. did that or my wife did that. And you're looking at it and like, mm, yeah, like, and you just, you know, even not even thinking about that hard, just a fleeting thought. So yeah, I was just, I was intrigued when you put that in your, in your bios and stuff. And I was like, oh, I gotta ask Amy about this. Cause yeah, I'm going to appreciate him even more now. So yeah. Thank, thank you for that. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. Good. All right. Then now the last couple of questions of the main portion here, I mean, they're all kind of like writing <clears throat> centric stuff, like the actual craft. And we like to ask these on this podcast of all the writers that come on. So what is your writing routine? Like what, what's, what's your routine kind of like for, for crafting? Yeah. I, I like to, you know, every day, my basic routine is I get up, I, now I write a card or a letter, you know, when I get to my desk, that's the first thing I do. And again, I have to force myself to do that sometimes. Yeah. And then I, I usually write for, I can go for about a couple hours in the morning. You know, I can write, depending on what I'm working on, I'm kind of between stuff right now. So that's a difficult spot creatively to be in. I'm working on something new, but that's always hard. So you have to force yourself to the table. So I, I usually go from about, you know, nine to 11, 30, 11. Then I try to read something right. before noon and then i i do take a lunch break and then i'm usually good from about one to three um unless i'm working on something that i have a deadline on or i'm like right in the middle of something and i'm on a good groove you know but i found now that i can replicate that whole routine while i travel and that's been um that's been really good because i've had more opportunity to travel and i've done some travel since we took our last kid to college where I've done it purposely. Like I've traveled and right. with the purpose of writing, that's just, that's my basic routine though. I can go for about two, two and a half hours before I get tired. And when I know like I'm done, like I'm not going to write anything else good, but I find it really good to read every day though, to read something yeah. every day for about 30 minutes. And I like it cause I'm asked, like I'm sure other people are sometimes to write something like a blurb on the back of somebody's book. And I love when somebody asks me that because it gives me a reason to read something I wouldn't normally read for 30 minutes. And that's my usually 1130 to 12 time slot. That's when I read that, you know, and I love, and I take notes on it. And I love that. Cause I think that just makes me, you know, it's different than reading something I want to read because it, pushes me outside of my boundaries and I have to read purposely because I'm going to have to say something about it. Right. I, I like when I have that to do though. Cause that, that really makes me, I think I write better in the afternoon when I do that from 1130 to 12. I think my, my afternoon session is better after that. That's fantastic. Yeah. We always like to ask the routines cause I, that's, that's the work, you know, that's the work of writing. Everybody just right. looks at the aftermath and not the, uh, the hours and hours. Another thing we like to ask writers, and you kind of already answered this, like we ask, how do you make a living? Do you make a living as a writer or do you make any money off the literature? I guess you said you freelance, right? Mainly. Right. Yeah. And then I speak the speaking. Oh, right, right. Yeah. And that's taken over some of my writing time because I, you know, you write the speech and then you write it different ways for, but then I practice it a lot. So right. that usually I do that late in the afternoon because then I'm done. I feel like once I get to the point where I, I'm done writing, then I do all the other things. Cause you know, the other thing about writing is then there's all the self-promotion and you know, all the other stuff you have to do. And like just the keeping the, the balls in the air kind right. of thing, you know, yeah. between the books and the speaking. But um, yeah, so I make, it's funny. The speaking is more lucrative than the, the, <laughs> The, the the books and the and then of course of course the freelance writing is a lot more immediate income because right. books aren't books are about you know trying to survive and make some money at the end of the process you know yeah, so yeah that's always interesting I I saw this one writer that said that she said books uh you know that you're not making much money off books anymore she thinks books are business cards now you know books yeah. are a business cards that you get yeah like a speaking engagement or something like you know. So oh, and they legitimize to... you. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. that's why the thing about the Dear Dana story, it just gives me a platform and the book makes me legitimate. And then, you know, making appearances or those things just, you know, add to your little resume, even though, you know, it doesn't make anything you did any better than anything anybody else did. It just gives you something <laughs> to talk about. You know? yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, another thing we like to ask writers, uh, what advice would you give to writers out there just starting out or maybe trying to build something on their own? Yeah, I think that you have to, you know, I, I, 
it's like the story of me writing my first book is I had to get to the point where I trusted myself like and, and legitimized, validated myself. And I think as a woman, this is a, especially true. And I'm not saying that's not true of men, but I see that in a lot of women, fellow women writers, like, you, you know, we require a little bit more validation. I think you, you, and I think the thing is you trust the subject you think you want to write about. I think we spend a lot of time, and you said this earlier in the podcast, like being like, oh my gosh, I need to – it's like almost like wine. You know, right. I got to snip the right corks here. I'm not I'm not legit. You know, like <laughs> don't tell anybody I like white Zinfandel. That's going to ruin the whole damn thing, you know. But I think you have to trust your – your gut, like I, we're, I think when we want to write, we want to write about something for a reason. We remember things, things stick in our minds for a reason. We have to trust ourselves and just sit down and write it, you know? And I think you trust your process too. I almost have to circle my desk three times like a dog before I sit down and actually do it. And then I sit down right. and actually start writing something good. Then I'll play Bejeweled for 15 minutes right in the middle of it. You have to trust that. That's right. the way it works. And you don't have to do it some certain way. And you don't have to have some kind of title next to your name to be a writer and i my my story is a testament to you know creating this whole entire like thing that shouldn't even be and that's it, it was just a series of moments where i don't know if i believed in myself i was desperate at first and then the ball just started rolling and i still don't know that i totally believe all of it you know but i would sit down and trust what you want to write about and trust the way you want to do it and then just see what happens because until you'll do that you're not going to know you know yeah that's great. Yeah. The, the comedian Lewis Black, he always said, uh, you know, he had a very kind of literary background where he studied playwriting and stuff in college. And he said, uh, he said, I don't know, I guess I always wanted to be a writer because you didn't have to do anything except say, huh, I'm a writer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's it. Just that's all it. you have to do. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and then and that's the other thing is, you know, I didn't forever. People like, oh, this is my friend Amy. She's a writer. I'd be like, oh, shut that down. Like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a writer, you know, I'm not. And I still do that. I still catch myself doing. And I wrote that first book and I, we got an editor because we're like, it's great. And that's the other reason I've had some success is because he's just been on board with everything. Because, you know, being married to someone writing books, that's dumb because yeah. you're like, you're over there and you won't talk to any of us and you won't open the door and you make eyes at us anytime you pass by. You know, and why are we doing this? Because nothing's actually going to happen. But so we get this editor and I remember I was on a call with her, and, you know, she was, uh, I was like, so, and she's talking about like technically what we're going to do with the book and, and I was like, so do you think it is like actually a book? And she was like, I don't understand your question. I was like, no, like, do you think it's actually a book? She said, why do you think we're even on this call? But even then I was like, I needed someone to validate the process. And I was an actually, you know, like, she was like, why are we doing this? You know, if you're not a writer and this isn't a book, like that's what we're doing. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> another thing I like to ask, and this is because, you know, like we, um, you know, everything you're consuming kind of fills your head and then kind of like uh, somehow makes its way into your work or your page. Not always, but sometimes. So we like to ask writers, uh, are you reading anything good, watching anything good, listening to anything good? And this can be anything. This could be, you know, high minded literary stuff or this could be like, you know, trash reality TV or something. You know, what's filling Amy's head right now? Uh, right. I'm reading The Nightingale by uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, I'm terrible with names. Let me look. It's incredibly i think it's hannah it's it's one of the best things i've ever read in my life uh kristen hannah and it is absolutely this she writes um you know historical fiction i don't know if you're aware of anything she's done but you know from a women's from a woman's perspective like her antagonists are their her heroines are women like in vietnam she wrote a great book about vietnam but this story is about these sisters in france and world war ii it is absolutely horrifying and fascinating and so well written almost to the point where it, like i don't want to read it because she's so good i mean there's uh -huh. no way i'll ever aspire to be it's just incredibly um inspiring and uh you know profoundly builds perspective, you know, about where we're at and, you know, experiences people of our grandparents' age had. It's just mind bending. So I'm I'm reading that. It's almost I'm almost done with it and I'm I'm gonna be very sad when it when it goes away. <laughs> That's and fantastic. The, uh, yeah. Another thing I recently read was uh the nineteen sixty three book by uh uh Stephen King. Where and it's kind of a time travel, which is oh, right, right. the the uh, the eleven twenty two sixty three, uh, yeah, the JFK, it, yeah, 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 and that was as a time travel. I've read I think every time travel book there's been. Um, it was so, and he's not somebody who I read regularly, but so incredibly entertaining and thought provoking, yeah. and 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 I think that's a book if you're into, if like if you 
time travel or history. It is just so fascinating. Okay. You know, got it right here on the shelf. Oh, yeah, there yeah, you yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great book, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a big Stephen King head too, and I'm I'm somebody that uh, I, I put myself in the position. You know, nobody put me in the position of of defending Stephen King with for literary merit in terms of how what he does and the kind of pop genre of particularly kind of how that affects what people would call the literary side of things. It affects it much more than people are willing to admit, you know, like and right. how important it is to the kind of, you know, American literary history and, and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I, I think he's, ins that. he's inspiring because he like switches yeah. gears so exactly. many times. Like yeah. his work does so many different things and that freedom to, you know, create something that's so different than, and he's just brave. I mean, yeah. I, he's got a name and everything, but still it's, it's brave to, it's like you were talking about Joyce's letters. I mean, it's just yeah. brave to be authentic, you know, and, and, and that should be celebrated, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And recognize, yeah. For what it's done for, I mean, I always, I call him the most influential American writer of the 20th century and people will be like, Oh, you know, oh, scoff at me when I say that. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm talking like, think of how many people have read those books it's much more than people that have read you know james joyce's books right. <laughs> okay like it's much more and a lot of writers are much more inspired by it you know not everybody but uh yeah so i, I love when people bring up king i always end up talking about it a little bit there uh and the final question we like to ask writers here is uh what are you working on now if you feel free to share it what's filling up what's taking up your time yeah i'm working on a humorous historical fiction book that um i came upon these uh I was, like I said, I like all things old. So I was on eBay and there was this lot of diaries by these, this mother and her daughter. And I like spent like $85 that I shouldn't have spent on it. <laughs> and I, and I read them and it, it's an incredible, fascinating story about this, this guy, this, it was the woman of this husband who ran these dance marathons in the twenties. You know, it was a big deal. Like they would run these dance marathons. These people would dance for days. This guy right, would run right. around the country and run these. And I, I knew a little bit about that. So I'm writing this historical humorous fiction based on these diaries that I read. And uh, I'm, I'm, I, it, I'm just now getting some traction on it. So I'm excited about it, but I'm not really sure which way it's going to turn, you know, and it's, uh, I want it to be funny and I want it to be um, yeah, like a funny, really like engaging historical fiction it has a lot of meaning, but it's all wrapped up in a bunch of silliness. I'm yeah. excited about it. That's great. It makes me think of that, you know, the great American crime novel. Uh, they shoot horses, don't they? You know, that yeah. the, with the dance marathon is like yeah. a huge part of that. Yeah, very. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that's where I first heard about it because I yeah, went yeah, yeah. It, and the diaries have been super interesting, like that process, because you don't you didn't know that people like I've looked them up after the fact, but there was not a lot about them. But you, a lot of it was like Nancy Drew. You had to figure out yeah. what they were talking about because you're looking at these regular entries over a 30 year period, yeah. you know, and I think it really unlocked something inside of me um, where this will be a much different project. I don't know if it's even going to, we, we go, right. go all the way to the finish line with it, <laughs> but it's funny how I had to figure it out backwards, you know, like I'd look stuff up and it was, it was like an investigation and it was really a, a great um, thing to go through. Anyway, I really enjoyed it and it, it was very eye opening. Just that's the process. Great. Yeah. Looking forward to that one. Yeah. That's going to be great. All right. Well, Amy, this has been fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Where, where can people find your stuff? Where do people find your books and all of that? Yeah. My, and thank you for having me on, Andrew. It's been great. I mean, I've enjoyed the conversation every minute of it. Um, but people can find everything about me at amydaughters.com. It's like the destination for all things me. And, you know, my email address is on there. The books are on there. Um, I'd love to hear from people. And my mailing address is on there. And if you write me, I guarantee you I will write you back 100%. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, this has been another episode of Heavy Board. Heavy board heavy i am heavy 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 board
gratitude for life. Forward. I, I aspire to believe them, I should say. Forward. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy. heavy. Forward. Has you the night sweats and the day sweats, pal? Pal, I do. If you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board. To get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast, become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy Board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored, full-length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers-only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavyboard.